for the afternoon or morning, uh, depending on where you find yourself. Uh, my name is Ebony Stevenson. I am the USDA Access and Accountability Organizer here at National Young Farmers Coalition. And I welcome you today for our in conversation discussion about 22007 discrimination payments. What I'm going to do is introduce um, our um, people on the call today. Um, I'm going to start off with Lindsay. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Keen. I work with the Farmers Legal Action Group. Um, I'm here along with my colleague, Stephen Carpenter. We're excited to be able to at least provide an overview of the Discrimination Financial Assistance Program and um, answer any questions that come up. So, Ebony, can I take it away or? Oh, yes. Okay. So, um, I thought to begin with, I'm just going to let folks know if you're not familiar with the Farmers Legal Action Group or FLAG, as we call it, we are a oh, nonprofit. I'm oh, I'm sorry, Lindsay. Before you uh, do the, the introduction of FLAG, can we introduce uh, Stephen and Shakira on as well? Absolutely. Hey, so I'm Stephen Carpenter. I'm a colleague of Lindsay's at Farmers Legal Action Group. And we're a nonprofit law firm that works on behalf of family farmers. We've been around a long time, and one of our priorities has always been civil rights and equality for farmers. So that's what brings us here. Shakira? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Shakira Regoza. I am the FSA technical assistant with National Young Farmers Coalition. So I assist farmers with accessing FSA loans and programs, and I am here to assist you if you're interested in applying for this assistance with the, the uh, 22007. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakira. Thank you so much for those who are joining us live on Facebook. Um, as the duration of the conversation, please feel free to drop any questions that you may have, um, and we will make sure that we get those answered before the end of this conversation. Now I'm going to turn the virtual mic over to Lindsay from Flag. Thanks, Ebony. Sorry, I tried to steal it earlier. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, Flag is a nonprofit law firm. We have a, a history of working on civil rights. Um, in relation to farmers and our mission is really to help keep family farmers on the land. So uh, we do that in a variety of ways, but I think most relevant to today and to thinking about um, uh, this program is we write a lot of materials that are intended to be for farmers and that are written from a farmer's perspective just to help break down whether it's a program, um, disaster relief, or in this case, you know, legislation that was passed by Congress that has the potential to really um, benefit some farmers. So uh, one thing I wanted to say before we dive into the details of this program is that um, we have so far published a very short guide to uh, the Discrimination Financial Assistance Program. It's a four-page guide, and I believe it is in um, the chat. Stephen loaded it there, and it helps to kind of summarize the program, much like we're going to be doing today. And I also wanted to let everyone know that hopefully within the next week, we're going to be publishing a much longer guide that will go into all of the details, probably more maybe than most people want to know, um, but many of the details and nitty gritty of the program. So um, we will be sure Ebony has access to that when we get it published, but just want to let folks know that that is on the way. Um, okay, Stephen, I'm gonna turn it over to you to give an overview of the program. Thanks, it's really uh, for both of us a pleasure to be here. Uh, we were really excited, have been excited to see the growth and progress of young farmers and um, people on this call that, that we, we know their work and they are really, really uh, doing a nice job. And it's there was an important uh, niche out there to be filled and you guys are doing a, a really terrific job of filling it. So we're, uh, as we say, gonna keep it brief here, gonna hit the very high points. Please feel free to um, ask questions in the chat or, you know, we'll, we Lindsay and I are gonna be, you know, perfectly happy to answer questions as we as we go along. 
So with that, let's start. So this is a, a government program. So it all sounds, it's going to feel like a lawsuit sometimes, but it's really not. It's, a, it's something passed by Congress. And what it is, is that Congress has said, we know that there was, has been a lot of discrimination at USDA, US Department of Agriculture, uh, especially in its loan programs over the years. And there has been a lot of uh, you know, lawsuits and bickering about it. Here's what they just, Congress decided to do. We'll create a program. We'll put $2.2 billion toward it. And we're just going to run a program that says, if you can show that you experienced discrimination, you're going to be eligible for a payment. And so what we're going to be talking about is kind of what the rules of that are and what you need, you know, what you might need to do to qualify and how to sort of get a grip on, on um, just the starting phases of how this might work. So it's $2.2 billion. It's real money. This is not like a fake program or a fake program with just a tiny bit of money. Um, and so it's, it's, it worth, it's worth at least checking out. So here we go. The discrimination in question and the things that the thing that you'll need to have done and um, to possibly qualify for this program is that you needed to have some sort of interaction with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's farm loan programs. Those are run by the Farm Service Agency. So if you go into a USDA office in your local area, it's, it's going to include FSA, as it's called. These are the USDA folks that make farm loans, your operating loans, you know, if you're trying to buy equipment and you need a loan or buying land. They make a lot of loans. They target people who can't get credit elsewhere. So that is like, that's beginning and young farmers, right? And so this program should be very, very helpful to uh, young farmers. The problem is that some that often there is discrimination, that there's been a history of discrimination at USDA. And, um, you know, it, it is a problem in an ongoing way. So you could be eligible for this program if you had an interaction with USDA's farm loan program, tried to get a loan or got a loan. It's the discrimination needed to have taken place before January 1st of 2021. And the discrimination, and when we talk about discrimination at USDA, there's a lot of discussion about discrimination based on race. That's included here. And color is, is the way the law, law calls it, race and color, those are included. So is ethnicity or national origin. So if you're Hispanic or Latino, the law sort of generally calls that national origin. You know, don't ask me why, but but that's, that's the way it is. That's covered as well. But so is discrimination based on sex and other gender-based uh, discrimination. So it's, a, it's the list of the prohibited bases of discrimination, as a lawyer would call it, race, gender, sex, et cetera. They're included on that four-pager uh, that, that there's a link to in the chat. So I think the short description of this is that for most of the kinds of discrimination that we tend to think of as illegal, they are covered in this. So if you went into an FSA office and you know they started saying stuff about trans people and wouldn't talk to you, you know you could be, I mean, that's discrimination. Or if they said women aren't good farmers, that's discrimination. So that's who this program is trying to get at and possibly uh, offer assistance to. So you do an application, you try to show that there was discrimination and you do that, you know, we'll talk in a second about how you might do that. And then it's gonna be possible for you to receive a payment of up to $500,000 based on the sort of discrimination that you can explain. There's a, what lawyers would call a burden of proof here or a burden of evidence. And it, it answers the question of, well, how much do I really need to show here? They, you don't have to have like a smoking gun recording them of you call them calling you names or something like that. What you need to show is they treated you differently because of your protected status. That is to say, race, gender, sex, um, if you're transgender, et cetera. And so 
All you have to be able to do is, I mean, not that this is easy, but you need to show that they treated you differently based on that. And that can be, they just didn't follow their own rules for you. They did for everybody else, but not for you. Or they were, they, they, somehow they treated you badly in the making of the loan. If they discouraged you from getting a loan, anything involving a loan transaction can qualify. So you fill out the application, you describe what happens to you, Somebody is going to look at all these and they're going to say um, there was discrimination or there wasn't discrimination. Um, and that's like the super basics of it. Lindsay, uh, why don't you take it and talk about uh, deadlines? Um, there, oh, thank you for putting the. So I'll just say one last thing. When you look, if you're, if you're, uh, if you can see the chat, there's the list of the prohibited basis of discrimination. We think it's pretty complete. I mean, we think most most types of discrimination are going to be covered in that. If you end up having a question about that, please feel free to contact us. Our email is in the in the chat, or talk to um, young farmers folks, and and we'll get back to you. So, Lindsay, your turn. Hey, thanks, Stephen. So, a couple of things to keep in mind about in terms of deadlines, and there's really two main deadlines I want to mention. The first is that the overall deadline to apply for this program is October 31st of this year, of 2023. And one thing I wanted to say on that is, you know, this sometimes programs are a first come first serve. It feels like you gotta apply the first day, otherwise you might not get anything. This is not a first come first serve program. So what that means is, you know, USDA and, and whoever is going to, you know, these there are these third party vendors who are going to be evaluating these applications and determining whether you know USDA discriminated against someone. Um, they are going to do that after everyone has applied. So there is not a risk of, you know, if you apply later of suddenly there's not enough money. What could happen is again, you know, USDA doesn't know how many people are going to apply for this program. So they might decide that if you know, tens of thousands of people apply that the money, you know, they're going to have to reduce everyone's award by a certain amount to keep it within the available funding. But again, um, I just want people to know, you know, I would not, I encourage folks to get started on the application because as we're going to talk about, it is long and it, it requires a lot of information, a lot of documentation, but just know that the best chance of success in this is to do a thorough job, to take your time with it, and to trust that, you know, you know, if you submit a great application on October 29th, you know, you're not going to be in a worse position than someone who files one today. So that was the first point I wanted to make about the deadline. Um, so that is the deadline to submit the application, the completed application. The other important deadline is relates to documentation. And so again, because this program is about discrimination by USDA for um, and in their farm lending programs, for many people, a lot of the documents that they might want to use to show that they got a loan from USDA to show, you know, various like what the terms might have been, you know, for many folks, those documents might be in the hands of USDA. And so what USDA has said is they have set up a process where farmers can email them with a request for documentation, but that email has to be sent by September 6th of 2023. So that is in just a few weeks. And um, we can put a link to the information that's required. Uh, there is an FAQ that USDA has put out that lists, it provides the email address that you need to send the request to and all of the information they want from you. And they do want information so they can identify you, so they can identify when you might have applied for a loan. You need to articulate what types of documents you're looking for. So there's a specific process to follow. I just want you to be aware that it exists and that the deadline to make that request is September 6th. The caveat I will say to that is it remains unclear to us, and I think to most people, uh, whether USDA will be able to fulfill all of those requests and to what extent. And so, you know, it's possible that they may no longer have documentation. It's possible, you know, we don't know the extent they're going to look for documents. Are they going to um, 
go to local offices or storage centers where paper copies might be met, right? If they don't have it a lot electronically. So there's a lot of unknowns about this. And so I encourage you, even if you make a request from USDA to receive documents, to be thinking about what might a plan B be for you in order to um, provide the documentation that's needed. So again, October 31st, the final application deadline and September 6th, is the deadline to email your request to USDA for documents that you believe they have. Okay, Stephen, any final thoughts before we go through it, the application quickly? Yeah, maybe just two quick ones. So we're gonna talk, we wanna talk about the application and I'm just gonna warn you, the application is long. Lindsay's gonna kind of run through it, but don't be, don't be frightened. I mean, um, or put, I mean, you can be put off by it, but it's it's still worth doing, we think, if you believe you've experienced discrimination. It's just, I'll, I'll say again, it's it's a real program. So we did, wanted to say two quick things about when you try an application before we look at the application itself. One is just step back for a second. What's about to happen if you do this application is that somebody who's never met you, who doesn't know you, doesn't know anyone involved, needs to be convinced that discrimination took place. And so there are kind of two ways that you can make that case to persuade somebody what what really happened to you. And those, there are two, as I say, two things. One is to fill out this application and really put the details of what happened. It's not going to be a lot of fun, right, to describe what went down, but it's really important to create the true story of what occurred to you in this application to have success with it. So it's just not going to be enough to say, well, they wouldn't give me a loan. It's really important to say, I went into this office. If you remember the name of the person you dealt with, that's good. What did you want a loan for? What were you going to do with it? How does it affect you when you didn't get the loan? What did they say to you? Those are the sorts of things that can help you make the case to convince a person, again, who's never going to have met you, don't know anything about you, right, that you can explain to them what really went down. The second thing you can do to help make sure that the person making decisions on these, on these applications understands that what, what you did and what happened and what they did is if you can pull together documents. There are going to be some documents that USDA is going to require you to have, like to prove your identity. But some documents are kind of your choice to put in there, but they can be really important. So, for example, USDA wants to know for sure that you either farmed or tried to farm. Well, a document can do that. If you can show you had uh, seed costs or that you sold something or, you know, you had paid it for a membership, membership in a farmer's market, any like even a blank, you know, a check stub, weirdly, or just a receipt that begins to show that you actually farmed, that's going to help you. And it helps pull together your explanation of what really went down. So if you actually got a loan, if you have any of those documents, that's great. If you have a loan denial, that's great. Anything that you can sort of help put together that includes documents, including statements by other people that remember you saying, you know, dang, I was trying to get a loan and they just brushed me off. That's a sort of thing that you can include. So with that, uh, Lindsay, let's look at the application. Okay, thanks, Stephen. So we're going to try to go through this um, fairly quickly because I know or I believe there might be some questions out there. Um, so I am going to share my screen if I can. Um, okay, I think I did that. Can everyone see it? Uh, a copy of the application. Okay, I see heads nodding. So um, one thing to know about this application, as Stephen mentioned, it is in paper form 40 pages long. So that can be a bit daunting. Um, not every section is going to apply to every farmer. And the way that the application is structured, they've divided it into 10 steps. So they kind of break down the type of information the application is looking for at each step. The other thing that I think is helpful to be aware of as you look at the application is that um, in some parts, it will have a sidebar that um, describes the type of documentation that you can submit. 
And the important thing to know for that is, and they say this at the very top here, some documents are required. So the application uses the language must. So whenever you see must, it, as it sounds, it means you need to provide that documentation. There are also um, several places where the application kind of suggests what would be helpful documentation to provide. And that language they use is the may. So when you see the word may, again, it, as it sounds, it's not required, but you know, as Stephen and as we've talked about, we think it's really helpful to your application if you can provide even those not required documents, because again, it just helps you tell your story. So um, I'm gonna quickly walk through what these 10 steps are just to give you a sense of it. You know, the first one, as it says, is step one about you. You know, this program provides payments to individuals, to not to entities. And so that's important because as we know, many farmers decide to form an LLC for their farm or they, you know, some other legal entity. And the way this program will work is they will, if you are an entity, there's another step that we'll ask for information on that, but they will provide a payment based on your percentage share of ownership in the business. So the first thing is because they're providing payments to individuals, they wanna know who you are, who was the person who was discriminated against. So that is this step fun, step one, the identifying information. It does ask for a lot of information, social security numbers, things like that. So just be aware of that. If you had a, you know, a previous name, so if you've changed your name since you worked with USDA or applied for a loan, you know, it's gonna be important to be pretty thorough in um, any previous names that you had. And then you can see on the second page here, this is where it's describing the types of documentation, again, that you must provide in order to show your identity. So just be aware of that. Then um, I'm gonna jump ahead to the second step. This is uh, called the type of applicant. And the reason this is important is because, you know, as we all know, you could have applied for a loan with USDA on your own as an individual, as the sole borrower, or for some people, there's a co-borrower, and that is typically a spouse. So if you did apply to USDA for a loan or received a loan, and someone else signed that promissory note, signed the loan as a co-borrower, this program requires that you provide information on that co-borrower. So that's an important thing to be aware of. And then the final thing I will say about step two um, there's one other type of applicant that might be at play here. So obviously, if you personally experience discrimination, you know, before January of 2021, you can be eligible. Um, the program doesn't allow estate claims, meaning that let's say you have a grandparent who was discriminated against by USDA in a loan, and you wanted to apply on their behalf for this program. That is not possible. Congress decided that was not something that they were going to do with this program. But the only exception to that, and that's these highlighted ones I am showing on the screen now, is if for some reason, let's say your, your grandfather's loan was assigned to you. So if that loan was assigned over to you, and now you are the one responsible for the payments, you are the one responsible for that loan, um, you assumed the debt, essentially. So if that loan was assigned to you, and you assumed that debt, um, you are eligible to apply. And I know I'm going very quickly through this, so please, if anyone has questions on that, feel free to email Stephen or I, and we'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump ahead to the third step and pardon the, the scrolling. Um, so the third is eligibility as um, if you were a farmer or rancher. So the important thing to know about this is just that the program allows you to apply, obviously, if you farmed or ranched, but also if you tried to get a loan and you had every intention of farming, but because USDA discriminated against you, maybe you didn't get that loan and maybe you were never able to farm. But if you can tie the reason to you not being able to farm back to discrimination by USDA, you are eligible to apply. So what step three is, um, is getting at is for just for those of you who are farming or have farmed. So if you never farmed, this is not a step that you will need to address. Um, 
for those farm or for those people who tried to farm but were never able to, that comes up in step four. And again, I apologize for the scrolling. You can see there's a lot of information that that they request. So step four is, you know, if you are applying to this program as someone who did borrow or attempted to borrow from USDA in their loan programs. So um, they're going to ask if you tried to get a direct farm loan from USDA. Um, they're going to ask if you tried to get a guaranteed loan. And for those who are less familiar, you know, a guaranteed loan would be if you actually went to a bank or a credit union and applied for a loan and it was backed by USDA, it was guaranteed by USDA. So it is possible for you to be eligible for this program with a guaranteed loan, but it is a bit more challenging because you have to be able to show that the discrimination was not by the private lender, but instead by USDA. So, um, so step four is gonna ask you about those loans. Um, whether the direct or the guaranteed. And you can see here, this lists several of the loans that are eligible. Um, again, you know, does it, programs like disaster programs are not eligible for this. So just because you've worked with USDA doesn't mean you might be eligible. It really does have to be part of a farm lending program. So farm ownership, operating loans, conservation loans, youth loans, micro loans, things like that. So that is step four. Um, and then step five really gets into the details about the discrimination. So this is where you're gonna identify um, what protected class you're a part of. So Stephen talked about earlier, you know, if you, in other words, were you discriminated because of your sex or because of your you know, disability or religion or your sexual orientation? This is the step where you describe that um, and in some cases, there might be more than one reason that you believe you were discriminated against. So that's okay to put there. Um, and then they're gonna ask about for those details on what happened. So as Steven said, it's important to be thorough, um, to provide any documentation you have, and also to be aware that you can describe multiple instances. If you notice here on the application, it says instance number. So, you know, you may have tried to get a loan from USDA three or four times, and maybe every time something happens. We encourage you to feel free to describe those uh, thoroughly. Okay, I know we're running up against time, so I'll try to even more quickly go through the rest. Um, so step six is trying to get at what, uh, what your loss was because of the discrimination. So it's going to ask if you had owned land, did you lose that land? It's going to ask, um, so there'll be details on that, um, or whatever other type of loss that you endured because of this. Step six is the place where you describe that in as much detail as you can. Um, and let's see, step seven. So step seven asks questions about prior claims, complaints, and appeals. And what this step is getting at is, um, as many of you might know, there have been a previous lawsuits against USDA for discrimination in the early 2000s and you know, up to more recently. Um, black farmers had a lawsuit, Pigford. There was a lawsuit on behalf of women, on behalf of Hispanic farmers and Native American farmers. If you want to apply for this program and you previously participated in a lawsuit, you can absolutely still apply. You just need to let kind of in this part of the application, you just need to let them know that you were a part of a prior um, claim or lawsuit. And similarly, as many of you might know, USDA has a discrimination complaint process. So even before this program was released, um, it was possible to file a complaint against USDA for discrimination. If that's something you have done previously, step seven is where you just provide details of that. Um, we don't believe there's any reason to think that even if you were part of a lawsuit and didn't prevail, or if you, you know, filed a discrimination complaint and didn't win at that time, that does not mean that you should not apply for this. The standards are different, and um, at least Stephen and I think it still can be worth your time to consider applying. 
So that was step seven. Uh, step eight, I'm going to gloss over very quickly. It's simply if there's anything else that you want to note on the application that they don't ask for, this is the step where you get to provide it. So if you have more details um, or other information that you think is relevant, that's where you note that. Um, step nine is about taxpayer information. This could seem kind of confusing why that's in there, but uh, right now it seems likely that any payment you might receive from this program could be taxable. There's not, it, there's not a clear yes or no on that, but it does seem likely. And if that's the case, they are trying to get um, your taxpayer information essentially so that you could be taxed for it. So this is the step that asks for that information. Again, I think we have a feeling that USDA is going to release more information on the tax consequences, but right now we just don't know a whole lot. So um, be aware of that. And then finally, step 10, um, this is the signature and certification, uh, kind of the final step. So this is where you as the person who is applying for the program, as the person who like the experience discrimination, you're essentially certifying by initialing and signing that everything that you put in here is true and accurate to the best of your recollection and your knowledge. Um, and then there is also, if you work with a, like a technical assistance provider. So if you're working with young farmers to help get your application filled out, the final page is for um, that preparer, the person who's helping you, for them to certify and initial that, you know, to their knowledge, everything in there is accurate and true. And they also sign that. So that's a protection for those folks who are helping farmers apply. So Ebony, I know I went over, I'm so sorry for that. That was the very quick run through. Um, and unless Stephen has anything he wants to add, I think we would be open to any questions that have um, come up. I think that summarizes it. Um, so we'd be, and I've got to say too, we'd be, ha you know, our email is in the chat. If you, if anybody follows up later and wants to contact um, uh, National Young Farmers or us, you know, we're we're going to be all happy to try to answer questions going forward as well. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think that that's the fastest that I've seen the <laughs> the application process. But Lindsay, um, you did such a great job. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to ask um, Letitia. Shout out to Letitia for comms at National Young Farmers Coalition who's monitoring uh, Facebook. Do we have any questions on Facebook before we get into a couple of frequently asked questions? I'm not seeing any questions yet, but I'll keep monitoring. Okay, awesome. All right, so um, I'm, I have a couple of questions uh, that I just want to you know, ask so that it's recorded on the live uh, because this is the questions that farmers have been asking me. And I don't know, Shakira, uh, if you have any questions, um, that you would like to share that farmers have asked you so that we can get clarification. That would be great. Um, the first question um, that I did uh, get asked was around if you apply for these discrimination payments, does that affect any, uh, let's say, like there's a future situation where there's discrimination payments or discrimination lawsuits? With you applying for these funds through 22007, would that affect any future payments that you will be, um, uh, that you could possibly get? Does that have an effect on that? Not so far as we know. So, for example, if you apply for this, you are not promising to never sue usda you know like sometimes if you're in a lawsuit and you take money you also have to promise never to sue somebody again on the you know on something related there is nothing like that in this i mean you, you can never say never about you know future possibilities but we don't see any way in which you could be limited in the future if you did this now um so, I mean, Congress could create something, you know, that you just never know what they're going to do, but it's it's not like there's some sort of 
right to sue that you've lost if you do this that's sort of hidden in the small print um, would be my answer. Lindsay, does that sound anything to add? No, I think that sounds accurate to what we know. Thank you. Um, another question uh, that I was asked was around um, when farmers fill out the application, and I believe you said this uh, before a uh, lot of time season about really breaking things down step by step and creating a narrative about exactly what happened to you because you know you want whoever reviews this application to have an accurate understanding of all the things that you went through so don't leave anything out um someone asked me that if they fill out the application and they talk about the discrimination that they receive from their local office does anybody from the local office have access to this information that they will be able to retaliate against them if they actually use USDA staff names? So it's, it's a very good question. And I think that, you know, let's we'll, we'll say this first of all, USDA says that nobody at USDA can retaliate. And it's super clear that if they retaliate against you, they're breaking the law. So um, can we promise that that will never happen? No. Um, I, yeah, I mean, we're talking about USDA. It's like, yeah, retaliation is possible. I mean, just say it flat out, it's possible. It shouldn't happen, obviously, to repeat, it's illegal if it happens to you, uh, I know Lindsay and I would want to know about it. That would be, you know, we we would be interested to know that and would do whatever we could um, to try to to help, you know, deal with that. I mean, I don't know that we could file a lawsuit for you, but, you know, we would try to be as helpful as we could. Um, I would say also that in the future, one of the things that USDA has said is that if you if, if you really, really have a difficult time dealing with that local office, they will let you go talk to a different local office. Now, you know, will they be better? Actually, maybe, right? You know, so um, if there's if it's the people in your local office that are just really, really tough for you to deal with, you can go nearby. So keep that in mind as well. I wish I had a better answer. I wish I could say, absolutely not. There'll be no retaliation, but you know, we're talking about USDA. Yes, this is this is very true. Um, even in that situation, um, and Shakira, uh, you can uh, add on to this. We, even though that we know that that's supposed to be the case, we have heard for farmers, um, and a particular farmer who was having trouble with her local FSA office and they sort of poisoned the NRCS office to her plight. And she tried to go to a different office, but then the original <laughs> uh, person from her local FSA office reached out to the office that she went to and told her that she had to come back to the original office. So these are just um, um, things that, you know, farmers are going through and it was, it was um, such a crazy situation because uh, it's just examples of we know that these are things that that does happen, unfortunately, uh, dealing with the USDA. So, but thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, also, uh, a question that's been asked to me several times is uh, to fill out the application. Uh, even if you experience discrimination in the past, are you able to complete the application if you are not currently farming? Yes, the, the short answer is yes. You, um, you do not need to be currently farming. Um, in fact, it's possible that you never farmed as long as you had a plan to, you had every intent to, and USDA's discrimination, whether it be in denying a loan or, or something similar, is what prevented you from farming. So um, yeah, there's no requirement about what you're doing now. Awesome. Um, and then I just have two more questions, and then I'll open it up to see if Shakira has any before we close out. Um, another question uh, that was asked to me 
was around um, what if the discrimination occurred uh, when you were trying to get a youth loan, but you never even got to the process of filling out the application because they never sent it to you. It's a very good question. And there's sort of two pieces to the answer. One is that youth loans are eligible. They're a part of this. And so for people who didn't know, you know, don't remember or did never heard about a youth loan. It's for a smaller amount of money. People usually, uh, you have to be sort of working with 4-H or FFA or somebody like that. And they'll, they make a lot of loans to like help you get started, you know, with a cat, a couple of calves or something, if you, if you're going to do that. And the other, the other half of it is that for youth loans and for everything else, if they discourage you from applying or don't give you an application or just tell you that you're not eligible, those are all discrimination and they're covered in this program. So you do not have to have an application denial in a letter. Now you need to explain what happened and you need, you need to do really as much as you can to sort of fill in the details. And it's a little bit more of an uphill slog to sort of describe what happened if you don't have a denial letter, but you are eligible definitely if you were discouraged or you know denied an application. And you're also definitely eligible if the discrimination was about a youth loan. And I would just add one thing to that. I think as Stephen said, it is more of an uphill battle, especially just in terms of the documentation, right? And the supporting evidence. But keep in mind that this program does allow you to submit sworn affidavits. So let's say you had applied for that youth loan. They never even gave you the application and you were furious and upset and you told a friend about it at the time. That friend, if they remember what happened, they can you know, sign a sworn affidavit just saying that, yeah, on this day you came and talked to them, you said the office would not even, you know, they didn't even listen to you, they didn't give you the application, whatever the facts might be. Um, just know that that's a possibility of a type of document that you could submit in support of your application in a situation like that. Great. Um, and then my closing two questions um, is when are uh, the payments expected to be? Um, or, or like, when do people find out whether or not their application was even approved? And then do you know um, when, what the deadline is or what the timeline is for payments to be dispersed? So we can just tell you what, what we heard, uh, that their USDA says they would like to have all this wrapped up towards the end of the year. Now you're sort of hearing that early next year. So, you know, the short answer is you don't really know. I mean, this won't, I mean, it won't be years and years, if that's any help. I, if I had to guess, the payments that will be made will be made in the early part of next year would be a decent guess, I think. But nobody knows for sure. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys, I was muted and I was just talking, forgive me. Um, there was a question on Facebook about who can claim discrimination. So uh, Lindsay uh, or Stephen, if you can go into uh, those prohibited uh, bases that you discussed earlier. Stephen, do you want to? Otherwise, I've got a list in front of me. Sure, I'm going to go back to your chat. So, you know, we've all kind of heard of some of these, and but I, I have to say that USDA, I think, did a pretty good job of listing them. So it's race, color, national origin or ethnicity. So if you're Hispanic or speak another language, that's national origin or ethnicity. Sex, so that by that they mainly mean, you know, they used to mean male or female. Now, you know, things get... Be a little more complicated. Sexual orientation: if you're gay or lesbian, you're in. Um, in you're you know you're eligible. Gender identity: you know we take that to mean 
you know, if your trans are sort of any other non-conforming gender or sexuality, um, we think you're in. And if they, you know, we feel very strongly that you should be in. And so if there's a, a problem with that, that's something that we would be very concerned about and try to help on. Also religion, um, obviously age, um, age people mostly mean you know it's not this is not going to be young farmers B people get told they're too old to farm although i've got to say if somebody says to you or said or you think that they just didn't make you a loan because you were too young if you were old enough to sign a contract i think that you have a good argument to make here that um that was discrimination based on age and so i would i would not pause to do that if you think that's a, that's what happened in most states, that's going to be 18. You know, you should take a quick check. As long as you can sign a contract that makes that loan, um, they should be dealing with you as as everybody else. So marital status. So that one, you know, single, married, divorced, separated, uh, whatever, should not ever matter. Um, disability, I think, is one that people sort of forget sometimes. So you know, you can have, if you have, there's a definition of disability, which was going to be in our longer guide that the law uses. But basically, you know, if you, if you're technically disabled, that doesn't mean you can't farm. And if they wouldn't make a loan to you because of that, you know, you can be a part of this program. You know, lots and lots of people with disabilities farm. And um, yeah, so that, so that's protected. And then also, you know what we sort of mentioned before if you if you can see the chat reprisal or retaliation for prior civil rights activity so if you say in the past complained about discrimination and you thought that they did a reprisal to punish you for that that gets you in the door for this program as well you know like the reprisal itself is a form of discrimination or if you are active in any other civil rights activity for any of these above reasons say you know, you're a, a gay activist and you think that you know, your, your local office knew that and they punish you for that. That's basis for just, that's a discrimination that is covered under this program. So we, I mean, you know, we, we think it's pretty broad. I mean, we were, we were pleasantly surprised that they were this inclusive of the forms of discrimination that are still common in the US. Thank you, Stephen and Lindsay. Um, Shakira, did you have any uh, questions that you have received from farmers that you would like to share? No, I don't have any questions so far. Thank you, Lindsay. You answered most of them already, so that was great. Awesome. And then I'm going to ask Letitia one more time. Do we have any more questions on Facebook before we close out? Nope. Awesome. Okay, so um, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation about the 22007 discrimination payments. Um, I did put um, a link in the chat. Um, if you would like to receive uh, technical assistance, you can feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can reach me. Uh, my name is Ebony, E-B-O-N-E-E, -E -E, and my email is ebony at youngfarmers.org. Um, Shakira, can you say your email? Yes, my name is Shakira, spelled S-H-A-K-E-R-A, and my email is shakira at youngfarmers.org. And then Lindsay and Stephen, if you can share your email. Yes, of course. Do you want us to say it verbally? I know we both put it in the chat as well. Yes, and okay. you can do that verbally for those who are on Facebook. Absolutely. So um, I'm Lindsay. My email is l-k-u-e-h-n at flaginc.org. Thank you. And so I'm Stephen, and mine is S Carpenter, C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E-R -E -E at flag, F-L-A-G, Inc inc.org. Thank you. Oh, and then Leticia said she actually put our emails in the Facebook comments. So thank you, Leticia, always on the one. 
Okay, so thank you for joining us. This is just an introductory conversation to introduce you to 22007 discrimination payments and the process. We will be having a follow-up webinar next month to go over the actual application and to go over any issues that people are having with the application. So please feel free to stay tuned for that. And don't forget, if you if you are interested in receiving technical assistance or you just have some more questions, do feel free to reach out to us. So thank you so much for joining us and you have a great day.